The story you are about to hear is true. Attention, all true. She's alive. Alive! Welcome to the Retroist. As a kid, much like everyone else, I sounded different. And not just the tone of my voice. It was much higher pitched when I was a kid. But also, I had a much thicker New Jersey accent. Very thick. I'm not just talking a mild amount of New Jersey accent, but a very developed, almost movie-like, comical New Jersey accent. My whole family had them. Some of them still have lingering bits of it. I'm not sure why theirs have faded. They have lived in New Jersey. I have moved around, so mine has slowly faded away to some extent. But when I was a kid, even up until I was a teenager, it was in full force. Now, I loved television and movies and would find myself doing lines from whatever I was watching at the time. I'm not sure when it started, but at some point, I began to try to imitate the people who were the actual actors, so trying to do a different voice. When Transformers came out, I was quite smitten with Optimus Prime, and the person who provided the voice for Optimus Prime, Peter Cullen, had based Optimus Prime on the actor John Wayne, which if you've heard Optimus Prime, you might think, yes, that's obvious. I thought I could do a pretty dead-on impersonation of Optimus Prime at the time. And my friends, who all had the same accent as I had, didn't seem to disagree, because when we would play with our Transformers, I would do my Optimus Prime voice, and they wouldn't say anything. Then one day, we were playing, and one of my sisters came out to watch us play and smoke a cigarette. I got to play Optimus Prime that day, I'm wheeling him up, and I can't remember what line I did, but I tried to do my best Optimus Prime impersonation. And my sister starts laughing, the type of laughter that made her almost drop her cigarette. And then she said, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm, I'm Optimus Prime. She said, you sound like Yogi Bear. That is all my friends needed to hear. No longer could I do the Optimus Prime voice when we played. Instead, if I ever tried to do it again, it was greeted with gales of laughter as they heard the Yogi Bear voice while I was trying to do Optimus Prime. The problem was... I could never seem to remember this, or I would get caught up in the moment and I would do the Optimus Prime voice again, something about Autobots rolling out, and then I would be completely destroyed by everyone around me who thought it was hilarious. My sister had no idea what sort of can of worms she was opening at that point, and I don't think if she did she would have stopped, because that's the type of thing that if you have a sibling it's too hard to let go. Over time I realized I should not try to do an impersonation of Optimus Prime, nor John Wayne, nor Yogi Bear. I just didn't want to get made fun of anymore. I learned that that voice was not in my wheelhouse, and even though I tried to master it, even recording myself doing it, I just could never master it. But still, it's a great voice, and one that I heard a lot while watching one of the great cartoons of the 1980s, The Transformers. On today's show, I'd like to talk to you about this amazing, groundbreaking cartoon, We'll talk about the people who created it, the people in front of and behind the camera, the series, its reception, the music, and we'll throw in a few surprises here and there. We have an info-packed episode ahead of us, so without further ado, let's start the show. The Transformers was a animated television series that ran from September 17, 1984 to November 11, 1987. It was based completely on Hasbro's Transformers toy line. 
This would be the first TV series about the Transformers. There would be others. And if you're not familiar with the concept of the Transformers, it's about two factions of giant, intelligent robots who have the ability to transform. And they have landed on Earth, and they're still waging war amongst each other with humans stuck in the middle. The show was produced by Marvel and Sunbow Productions, along with the Japanese animation studio Toei. If you are looking online for information about this series, it is mostly known as Generation 1. It got this label in response to a rebranding of the Transformers franchise in 1992 as Generation 2. Now, I just did an episode on the Transformers toy line, so if you have not given that a listen, I think you might want to step back and do that. Otherwise, I'd be repeating a lot of the stuff about how the Transformers toy line came to be, and that's important for the Transformers cartoon and what that would turn out to be. But we can just say that the Transformers toy line was inspired by various Japanese toy lines, namely ones by Takara, their Microman and Microman spin-off Diaclones. Those ones had these little humanoid figures that were able to get into the driver's seat of vehicles that could transform into humanoid robot bodies. These would get spotted at the Tokyo Toy Fair by product developer Henry Orenstein, who thought this would really play well in the United States. He brought the concept to the head of Hasbro's research and development division, George Dunsey. Both of them gave it a big robotic thumbs up. And it was decided that they would bring the toy lines to the United States, make some small changes to the toys themselves, mainly that the little figures wouldn't be inside. But that came from trying to figure out what is the story behind these robots. And to really develop it, they went to Marvel Comics at the time and Marvel's editor-in-chief, Jim Shooter. He created a concept for what would become the series about two warring factions of robots the good Autobots, and the evil Decepticons. He would hire editor Dennis O'Neill to work on the characters, mainly the names and profiles, but Hasbro didn't like the work he was doing. When they pushed back, O'Neill said no, and they would approach several other writers and editors who all didn't want to work on it, and then they found Bob Budiansky, who took on the task. And Hasbro loved his work. This would eventually lead to comics. Now, we've all heard of Marvel and Marvel Comics. We'll talk a little bit about the split between Marvel Comics and Marvel Productions later and a strange product that came from the separation of those two. But let's talk a little bit about Sunbow. Sunbow really worked a lot in the 80s, noted for their partnership and work on the Hasbro toy lines of cartoons, namely things like G.I. Joe, Transformers, and My Little Pony, amongst others. In the late 90s, Sony Wonder which is part of Sony Music, bought Sunbow Productions because they wanted to expand their television programming. Then in 2000, TV Loonland AG would purchase Sony Wonder's television assets. In 2007, Sony Wonder was moved into Sony Pictures Home Entertainment. And then in 2008, Hasbro got the rights of all of Sunbow's productions of its animated series. They paid $7 million for that, and that included the Transformers along with My Little Pony, Gem, and the Holograms, and of course, G.I. Joe. They worked on a lot of great shows and movies, including things like The Tick, but also all of the theatrical stuff like the Transformers, Inhumanoids, G.I. Joe, and My Little Pony movies. Now let's talk a little bit about Toei. Toei is a Japanese animation studio controlled by the Toei Company, produced a lot of stuff in Japan for the Japanese audience that has since gone worldwide. But most American audiences are going to know them because they provided the animation to a lot of great studios of the 80s on television, including Marvel, Sunbow, Hanna-Barbera, Deke, Disney, and Rankin-Bass. So you get things starting in the early 80s, like the world of Strawberry Shortcake and Spider-Man in 81. Then things really take off when you get to things like G.I. Joe. They would work on Inspector Gadget, Dungeons and Dragons, the Transformers, the Snorks. The list goes on and on. So if you're watching a lot of the shows from that era and you think, well, stylistically, they have some things in common, that might not be very far from the truth because there is one powerhouse of an animation studio working on a lot of these things. So how does this show come to be? I talked a little bit about this in other 
episodes I've done on animation of this era. In 1981, Ronald Reagan appointed Mark Fowler as the chairman of the FCC, and Fowler would change how toys were sold in the United States, and by doing so would change television and basically dictate a lot of people's childhoods. There had been regulation in place that were supposed to shelter children, making it so that you couldn't make a TV show about a toy. Those things would be looked at as advertising. But under Fowler's direction, those restrictions would come down and lots of things would get green lit. And things like Strawberry Shortcake and He-Man and the Masters of the Universe blazed a path that things like the Transformers and G.I. Joe and other properties that would follow would really master. Although Transformers and G.I. Joe, along with He-Man, probably did it better than most. Are you a fan of the Retroist podcast? Do you like more retro stuff? Why not check out the Retroist Patreon? Go to patreon.com slash retroist. Supporters of the show get bonus episodes, bonus tracks, bonus scans, access to the Retroist Discord, and more. Feel good about yourself and make a difference in the world. Support the Retroist. If you're watching the Transformers, you will notice something. Is this show called The Transformers or Transformers? Because in the credits of the show, they drop the the. It's just Transformers. But in the comic and in the toy line, it was the Transformers. It's not clear why, except for maybe artistic license, they did this. Officially, it's the Transformers. But you will see in TV listings, and of course, as I said in the credits, them called Transformers. So I think if you're referring to the cartoon, you could probably say Transformers. Although most people will probably think the Transformers is the correct way to say it. So writing and the distribution of the show was done jointly by Marvel and Sunbow. Marvel would briefly pitch their own idea to do the show. That was shot down by Hasbro. And I want to talk a little bit about the side effect of that in a second. But animation would be produced overseas by Toei for 68 episodes and then by Acom for 22 episodes and Cy Young Animation Company for at least one. And then there are some episodes that they don't even know the studio that produced them. They had to change some of the designs for ease of animation. So if you are watching the cartoon and expecting it to match up with your toys, they don't. And that meant that artists needed to make decisions. There's a lot of names that get a lot of credit for this. You get a lot of the original designs by Shohei Kohara and Floro Derry gets mentioned a lot. So just know that those are two names amongst many others. On the animation side of things, on the story side of things, you get people like Dick Robbins, Flint Dillay, Bryce Malick, Marv Wolfman, David Wise, Donald Glutt, and Steve Gerber. They had some toys to sell, so this show was rushed. And sometimes from script to screen, it would be as little as four months. That is because they wanted the show to be in sync with the distribution of the toys. It's going to be on the shelf. They want that thing showing up in the cartoon, so kids are thinking, I want to own that toy. This caused some animation errors that people will happily point out online, and people will act like they noticed these things when they were kids. I'm not so sure they did. I hardly noticed any problems with the show as a kid. As an adult, I see them, though. The people who worked on the show did not like this rush schedule. Donald F. Glutt has stated many times that he did not like working on the show. And I think in 2007, he said he only worked on it for the money, even though he would work on some of the most famous episodes of the show. Another problem with this rush schedule is that the show itself is not self-referential. Each episode could stand alone. There's a couple of episodes that made references to the episodes that came before it, but they're fewer and far between than they should be to develop a mythology. If you were a fan and wanted more of that, you should really be looking toward the comic book. One of the things that bothered me as a kid is the clear delineation between the Autobots and the Decepticons when it comes to flight. The Decepticons could fly, the Autobots were wheeled vehicles, which makes sense, they're called Autobots. But this was a choice that was made very specifically, not because jets are more threatening and evil looking, but because they thought that they wanted kids to not identify with the Decepticons. And at the time, the common thinking was that kids 
hardly flew. Kids did not get on airlines. They would see it as a very foreign thing. And so having the Decepticons have the ability to fly makes them one more step removed from the kids who would buy the toys. Of course, if you were playing with the toys, you could have the Autobots with jetpacks and everybody's flying anyway, because it wouldn't be very fair if you're playing to have the Decepticons have an ability that the Autobots didn't have. Thankfully, the Autobots and the Decepticons are terrible at killing each other, except for in a movie, which we'll talk about in a future episode, because they miss all the time. They have some of the worst marksmanship outside of the Star Wars movies. You'll see they will be standing feet from each other with these massive guns, and they will miss every time. Decepticons! Take your Autobots! Now you can watch the incredible adventures of the Transformers as heroic Autobots battle evil Decepticons five days a week. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. The Transformers are like nothing you've seen before. Don't miss a single day. The Transformers! The Transformers, Monday through Friday at 4. While reading about the Transformers, I learned about something called Car and Cable. As I mentioned, Hasbro had gone to Marvel Comics to pitch the idea for the show. They wanted Marvel Comics to help them develop the story and characters. Meanwhile, Marvel had something called Marvel Productions. And Marvel Productions would be the one who would maybe make the cartoon. The thing is, Marvel Productions and Marvel Comics weren't always in agreement at the time. So while Marvel Comics would come up with the Transformers story and characters that we all know today, Marvel Productions ignored what Marvel Comics had done and came up with their own original idea for a cartoon. And they went with a more Hanna-Barbera style show that is, if you're looking online, referred to as Car and Cable. It would have been about a transforming Volkswagen named Muffler and then three humans and their dog. Car and Cable was mentioned in a magazine back in 85. Most people thought that it was unrelated to the Transformers, but was just instead Marvel Comics' attempt to cash in on the transforming robot craze that was taking over the world. Then in 2020, it was discovered that there was a direct connection between the pitch and what would become Car and Cable, although it's not clear where the title Car and Cable came from. Maybe Marvel had pitched this idea or wanted to pitch this idea, saw that the Transformers was going in a different direction, and then just thought they could reuse it. We really don't know the full timeline of how this idea would have worked. There had been some other transforming toy lines that maybe Marvel was working with. Whatever the case, this almost seems like some fake joke out there, but there's lots of information on it out there. Just search Car and Cable. It looks like an 80s cartoon that you would have seen from Hanna-Barbera or Ruby Spears. It would have certainly been the type of thing that I would have totally watched. The show would premiere in first-run syndication on September 17th, 1984, and would run until November 11th, 1987. I printed out right here the schedule from that week in my hometown paper. And the Transformers are here, and they were on Channel 11, WPIX, at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, which would have meant I had to get home really quick if I wanted to watch the Transformers. And I can't remember if I was rushing home to watch them, but I kind of think I was, because on Mondays and Fridays, they used to show the Super Friends that I like to watch on WPIX, and then suddenly the Transformers appeared, and they would run that on Tuesday through Thursday. So you still had both of them running at the same time. They were up against Channel 5's offering. Channel 5 would eventually become the Fox affiliate, and they were showing Inspector Gadget. If you wanted some more adult fare, you could watch The Saint on Channel 9. Those were the sort of kid channels for me growing up, because they would show old TV or cartoons. So that would be at 3 o'clock, and, oh, and HBO was showing Remember When, which was a great series on HBO at the time. It was a sort of a nostalgia series. And that episode was called Wheels, Wings, and Whistles. And I'm going to guess that that's about planes, trains, and automobiles. So at 3.30 on Fox, you would have, depending on the day, either Woody Woodpecker and Bugs Bunny or the Care Bears. And then on Channel 11, I'm going to continue watching Channel 11 because that's Heathcliff, which I really liked. At 4 o'clock, you had Fat Albert and the Cosby Kids on Channel 5. On Channel 11, you had Voltron. At 4.30, Channel 5, He-Man and the Masters of the Universe. 
So I think I'm shifting to channel five because at this point, channel 11 is showing happy days at five. I should be doing my homework, but I'm not. Channel five is showing Gilligan's Island. And then channel 11 has shifted to Little House on the Prairie. So at this point, my sister might be taking over the TV, but maybe not because at 5.30, channel five is showing what's happening. And I was always watching what's happening. So I was pretty happy with that. You have a lot of good entertainment because I'm not even including what was on HBO. You had things like Oliver Twist, Video Jukebox, Fraggle Rock that week. On other channels, you're showing Voltron and Sinbad being played. So a lot of great TV going on at this point. Ooh, and an advertisement for ATCs, those three-wheelers. I've never driven on one of those, but I remember in the 80s wanting to. So that was what was on in my area. And the show would run for four seasons. First season would be from September 17th, 1984 to December 15th, 1984. And that was 16 episodes. Then they would have 49 episodes from September 23rd, 1985 to January 9th, 1986. A feature film would be released in August 8th, 1986. I'll do an episode on that in the near future. Then there would be season three, which was 30 episodes. And that ran from September 15th, 1986 to February 25th, 1987. And then finally, there would be three episodes released from November 9th, 1987 to November 11th, 1987. Now, the first season had a three-part pilot miniseries, which would eventually be called More Than Meets the Eye. This is the one that introduced us all to the Transformers. Then you would get season one. This would be commissioned and produced before the miniseries would even air. What's exciting is you're already getting new products from what would become the 1985 product line in this one. So Dinobots, Insecticons, Skyfire, and then the first of the combiner Transformers, the Constructicons, who could merge into the giant Devastator, which blew everyone's mind at the time. 49 episodes were commissioned for the second season, and that would bring the show up to the magic number of 65, which is what you need to move the series into broadcast syndication. And this is when you get really episodic. There is no need to play them in order. Even you can jump around for the most part. At the end of that season, new Transformers are brought in. Bots like the Aerial Bots, the Protectobots, the Stunticons. Then came the movie. And this changed a lot of people's opinion about the Transformers because they kill some Transformers in it. And even though it's an excellent movie, there was some public outcry around the death of Optimus Prime, which seemed to surprise the producers of the show, which makes me wonder that they ever watched the show and realize how amazing Optimus Prime is. Whatever the case, he would eventually wind up returning to the show. Season three picked up where the movie left off. It's a bit of a darker storyline, and things do change because the story editing duties moved to Marvel Productions, and animation would even change. This is when ACOM would take over, and so there would be a little bit of a different look to some aspects of the show. Most importantly, there would be a two-part season finale called The Return of Optimus Prime, which would air in March of 87. It's not over. Optimus Prime returns February 24th and 25th on The Transformers. See The Transformers weekday mornings at 8 on TV5. The fourth season would consist of a three-part finale miniseries. This was a push to get the Headmaster and Targetmaster toys into the show. Yet it doesn't really resolve the story, and there's room for the show to go on. And there would be more Transformers, but they weren't new episodes. Instead, a season five, I put that in quotes, was made up of 15 episodes from the previous seasons and the movie, which would be separated into five episodes with new opening and closing footage. They would continue to show the Transformers. I would catch this in the mid 90s. They would show it under the title Transformers Generation 2. This would show original Transformers as if they were a historical document, and they would add computer-generated scene transitions to spice things up. I wasn't a big fan. Just getting back to Season 1, and I'll move through this fast, there would be 24 Autobots featured in Season 1, and 22 Decepticons. In Season 2, there were 15 new Autobots, and 5 new Decepticons. 
and by the end, they would add 10 more Autobots and 10 new Decepticons, mainly in the form of the Aerial Bots and Protectobots and the Stunticons and Combaticons. Now, who was the first Transformer to appear in the series? It was Wheeljack. Congratulations, fans of Wheeljack. If you watch G.I. Joe, you might remember that they did these, and now you know, and knowing is half the battle, PSAs. They were going to do those in the Transformers. They would propose five of them. Sadly, they never aired, but they would appear as bonus features on several DVDs, so if you're looking for them, you can often find them posted online because of their shortness. There is so many people who provided their voices for this show, and a lot of them were great voice actors who provided lots of voices to different shows over the years. You have some very notable people like Frank Welker, who voiced Megatron, and Peter Cullen, who voiced Optimus Prime, Corey Burton, who voiced Spike, Christopher Collins, who would also do the voice of Cobra Commander with Starscream, Michael Bell, played Prowl, Casey Kasem, voiced Teletran, we'll talk a little bit about him in a few minutes, Don Messick was Ratchet, Scatman Crothers did the voice of Jazz, Dick Gautier did Rodimus Prime, Victor Caroli was the narrator, and there's just dozens of other names. Too many to list here. Frank Welker voiced Megatron. Fun fact, the original name Megatron was rejected by Hasbro because it sounded too scary to kids. But Bob Budiansky convinced Hasbro that, hey, a villain is supposed to be scary. Because the voice of Megatron put so much strain on Frank Welker's voice, he would ask to record his lines at the end of all the recordings because that raspiness would damage his ability to perform as any other character. Casey Kasem's time with the Transformers would be limited because, at the time, there was a lot of tension between the United States and Libyan President Muammar Gaddafi, and the Transformers played into that. They had a fictional country that Casey, who is of Arab descent, found offensive, and offensive enough that he said he wouldn't do it and would eventually quit the series because of it. Victor Caroli has a great voice, and he would be the narrator for the Transformers, saying things like, the Transformers will return after these messages. Such a great voice. He would provide voices and narration work for other TV series like Robotics, but also for lots of commercials like the ones for the Thundercats, Time Life Books, HBO. Just a great voice. From out of this world, into yours comes Voltron, Defender of the Universe. It's the biggest Voltron yet. The motorized giant commander. Batteries not included. You're in control. Command him to advance or turn in reverse. Prepare for battle. Move him out. Defeat the enemy and make the universe and your backyard safe again. The motorized Voltron giant commander new from LJN. If you watch the Transformers, the theme song is probably stuck in your head. They also used to do these great transitions with just a few notes where you would see a flip from the Autobots to the Decepticons and their symbol would show up on the screen when a little something like this. The music on the show was provided by Robert J. Walsh and Johnny Douglas. Johnny Douglas would compose all of the music used in the miniseries and Walsh would join during season one. A lot of the music would be a play on the original melody of the theme song, although they would also create lots of original shared tracks that would appear on other shows like G.I. Joe. They would also borrow heavily from the score that was made for the Transformers movie. Johnny Douglas was born in 1920, passed away in 2003. He was an English composer, musical director, conductor. He would create 80 albums and the music for 36 films. He was nominated for a BAFTA for his 1970 film, The Railway Children. But to people who are a fan of the Transformers, they will know him for his work on television. And that included cartoons like Dungeons and Dragons, The Incredible Hulk, G.I. Joe, The Transformers, and Spider-Man and His Amazing Friends. Robert J. Walsh was born in 1947, passed away in 2018. He was a conductor and director at Warner Brothers Animation beginning in 79, working with the legend Frizz Freeling on multiple Looney Tunes projects in the 1980s. He would then move on to Marvel Productions and work on My Little Pony, Gem, G.I. Joe, and the Transformers. He would then work with Jim Henson and Marvel on Muppet Babies. That would get him a Daytime Emmy nomination in 1986. 
Over the years, he would work with many legends of television and film, people like Glenn Larson, Stan Lee, and Jim Henson. Transformers was well-received by kids, and adults didn't know what to make of it. They saw this transforming robot craze coming into existence, and while they were ready for the toys, mostly because the media was reporting on them at the time, they weren't expecting the cartoon and the effect that would have on kids' desire for the toys. I will find articles online that talk about these shows as gimmicks for what would be, and I put this in quotes, the hottest toy trend ever. And they would lump it with things like GoBots and the Mighty Orbots. In a few of the articles I read, the animation is not very well received by people who think it's simplistic storytelling and that it's a giant commercial. But kids are pretty excited about what they're seeing. They like all the variety. But I saw an article that is just a few months after where they're interviewing a little kid who had been playing with his Transformers and watching the cartoons. And he admits he is not finding the robots as much fun as he did just a few months ago. I gave them to my little brother, he says. It just shows you just how so many kids would be excited for a toy, but then were very ready for whatever next trend was coming along. And there would be lots of them to come along in the 80s. I'm running away from home. My parents are mean. Where will you go? I'm not sure, but I'll show them. That's right. You'll show them how mean you can be. Bumblebee. Isn't it better to try to solve problems instead of running away from them? Maybe I could try talking to my parents again. Yeah, tell them how you feel. And remember, running away leads nowhere. Now I know. And knowing is half the battle. The Transformers. The show would air in other parts of the world, including in Japan, where the first two seasons of the show were known as Fight Super Robot Life Form Transformers, eventually getting rebranded as Transformers 2010, and they would stay very popular there, as well as in the United Kingdom, where they would be broadcast on TV AM starting in 1984, and eventually the Children's Channel in 87, then in syndication, would go even further on Sky One, Fox Kids, and so on. The Transformers movie would change the Transformers a great deal. It is probably the most important part of the Transformers progression as a franchise. Because of that, we're going to have to talk about that in its own episode coming up. And I mention that because I want to talk a little bit about what happened to the TV show. And this might not be a surprise to everyone, but the movie tanked. It didn't do as well as they hoped. And they had killed Optimus Prime. Why would they kill Optimus Prime? After that, despite the outcry, and probably because kids get bored easily, the ratings of the show went downhill. And even though these were commercials, you needed something that made these commercials worthwhile to make. And if the show wasn't doing well, that probably was a reflection of the fact that the toy line was not selling as well as it used to. And that's because there were other options. There had been a crash in video games, but Nintendo had roared to life and was creating great things. Video games were becoming more popular. Other toys were being released. And so because of the dwindling profits, the show was just getting too expensive to make. And so it was canceled. I worked at a video store in the 80s and 90s, and there were fans of the Transformers who wanted copies of these episodes. Specific episodes were released on VHS and Betamax by Family Home Entertainment. In the mid-90s, a Canadian company, Mallow Film, would release more episodes. None of these would be as popular as the movie would be when that came out on VHS and was available for people to buy or rent. Eventually, they would release the series on DVD by Rhino Entertainment Company. In 2005, Rhino lost the rights to distribute the Transformers on DVD. And as I mentioned, that would go to Sony Wonder. That's probably okay. I went out of my way to get that Rhino DVD box set. And it's messy. There's lots of problems. They put new sound effects in. I mean, it's great to own, but there's stuff missing from it. But I was excited in 2009 because Shout Factory got the rights to put out the Transformers. And they're known for releasing a pretty quality product. They fixed a lot of the errors that Rhino had introduced or not fixed. Overall, that is the product that I liked owning and still do to this day. Those are the versions I will watch. But I don't always need to pull out my DVDs because Hasbro decided to put all of these things up on YouTube. 
which is good because other people had been posting the Transformers up on YouTube anyway. It's nice that they got ahead of that. Finally, I want to talk a little bit about the connected universe. Talked a little bit about this in the G.I. Joe comics. These were people writing the same stuff, and there are connections between, say, G.I. Joe and the Transformers, and then you have connections between the Inhumanoids, and you have connections between Gem. That's a lot of fun, that all of these universes are somehow connected. I kind of wish that the animation had been more planned out or given more time, that these writers could have been given the time to fully make this a connected universe in some way. But that would be handled later in fan fiction and comic books. The Transformers cartoon started out as a commercial for these toys, but it became something bigger. It visually represented the show in a way that a comic or a toy couldn't. It showed us how we could play with the toys, but also gave them a voice for the first time. And to many of us who would try to imitate those voices, it was a real treat, even when those voices were mocked endlessly. Thanks for listening to the show. For more retro fun, you can drop by the website at retroist.com. You can follow me on social media. I'm at Twitter and Mastodon. On Twitter, you can find me at twitter.com slash retroist and on Mastodon at retroist at mastodon.social. The music you hear on the show is by Peachy. If you like what you hear, you should follow Peachy on Twitter and Twitch. He's at Peachy Pixel 8. That's the word Peachy, the word Pixel, and the number 8. Thanks to everybody who has been supporting the show. If you'd like to support the show, you could give the show a five-star review wherever you download it. Those five-star reviews are really what help people find the show. You could also join the Retroist over on Patreon. I'm at patreon.com slash retroist. Supporters of the show for just a few bucks a month. You have bonus episodes, bonus tracks, bonus scans, and access to the Retroist Discord, the greatest retro community on the internet. Thanks for listening to the show, and I hope you have a great weekend. Hey Autobots, let's move out. This has been a retrospective production. Goodbye.